Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Business Masters Live. Today's interview is sponsored by George Campbell and Jim Packard's book, The Consistency Chain for Network Marketing, a remarkably simple process for harnessing the power of habit, eliminating self-sabotage, and achieving your goals. So today we're really gonna be helping introverted entrepreneurs with how to overcome procrastination and build the business of their dreams and other important topics around taking consistent action. I highly encourage you to check out Jim and George's book, The Consistency Chain for Network Marketers for more. So the title of today's interview is Myths and Misconceptions About Taking Consistent Action That Can Kill Your Results. My name is Martin Meisenheimer, and today I'm talking with high performance experts, Jim Campbell, I'm sorry, George Campbell and Jim Packard about the common myths and misconceptions around taking consistent action that stop most introverted entrepreneurs dead in their tracks, really before they even get started. So welcome George Campbell and Jim Packard. Hello, sir, Thank how are you? Good morning. Great to Fantastic. be here. Fantastic, great to have you both here. Jim and George are well-known experts on the subject of taking consistent action, and they've graciously consented to this interview to share their extensive knowledge and experience and help dispel some of the common myths and misconceptions in this area that so many introverted entrepreneurs can, can really understand about overcoming procrastination and, and building the business of their dreams. So once again, George Campbell and Jim Packard, thank you again. Really excited to have you on today's program. Great. Oh, thank you, Martin. And my, my first set of questions for you is about your background and your experience in the field of taking consistent action so that the introverted entrepreneurs in our audience can understand who you guys are, where you came from, and really how you can relate to where some in the audience may be right now today. And then we'll jump into the main areas that, uh, that I know you're anxi anxious to cover sure. about common misunderstandings, misconceptions about taking consistent action. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Jim. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself or, uh, or if you want to talk about George, I know you guys like to, <laughs> to riff on each other. No, I, I hate to go first because that always gives him the, the chance oh, we, to go second. We, you we know, could let George go first. I don't mind. That's all right. He's he's the introverted one for sure. He, uh, but uh, I met George a few years ago, Martin. Um, I was in a uh, network marketing company, and uh, we had a pretty large team. And my son hired George to come in and speak to uh, uh, to our team. And it was on a weekend. I remember my son Jeff called me the night before and he said, hey, Dad, I've got a buddy that's going to be talking. Love to have you and Mom come down and support us. And uh, so we got in the car, took our dog, of course, because we couldn't leave the dog at home all day long. And we drove down to Tucson and 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 I kind of slipped into the back row because I had, you know, my little Cocker Spaniel on my lap and didn't want to, you know, disturb the whole crowd. But then my son Jeff introduces George as Joe Malarkey, America's worst motivational speaker. And I'm going, <laughs> now, why would he have somebody that's a terrible motivational speaker? But I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I realize, my goodness gracious, this guy is really good. He's really funny, and and I don't typically laugh at at comedians, but it, his sense of humor really, uh, you know, somehow just resonated with me. That was a good show. I even I got a barking ovation in that show. <laughs> but that's a true story. My dog my dog barked at him. And, yeah, uh, the first time I've been heckled by a dog. I've been I've had problems with cats in the past. I don't mind telling you, but that's the first dog related. <laughs> my dog is really smart and a good, such a good good judge of character. <laughs> I'm there, and and I didn't I didn't realize Martin at the time because my son never told me that George was in the Speaker's Hall of Fame. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, that's like people like Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar. And I later found out only 2% of all speakers are in the Hall of Fame. So that's a pretty big deal. Sure. The thing that impressed me, the, one of the things that impressed me the most was the fact that he was a stand-up comic for 10 years with Jerry Seinfeld and that whole group of comics that was coming up at the same time. But that wasn't the thing that impressed me the most. And yeah, he was on 60 Minutes. That's pretty impressive. But he was on to tell the truth. I used to watch that program. I love that. Yeah, yeah. that's a great show. 
I was the secret guest on that and nobody picked me. How sad is it to be on a show where you're appearing as yourself and nobody believes me? Well, you know, I'm sitting there, Martin, and I had a pretty decent business career and I had retired from that and I was in network marketing at the time. And, and I remember going up to George afterwards and saying, you know, George, if you ever want a partner, let me know. All right. Because I'd love to work with you and be on stage and I can be the Ed McMahon. You can be the Johnny Carson. I don't care. And, uh, and well, he didn't need me, Martin. He was doing fine on his own, had thousands of followers and all that. But I remember sitting there watching and going, boy, don't I wish he was on my team. I mean, he, what a, I mean, so extroverted. I mean, out there telling jokes and people were laughing and he had a following. Little did I know that he was uh, somewhat of an introvert. And it was probably a good thing that uh, he wasn't on my team because he would have uh, really frustrated the heck out of me. So <laughs> with that, I give you George Campbell. <laughs> That's why I hate to give him the mic now. Yeah. No. But but, so, I mean, the first time I saw Jim, he was on a stage at a network marketing company, and he was one of their absolute top producers. And I was sitting firmly in the back of the room holding down the last aisle. And I was one of their non-top producers, which is that's where they put them, way in the back. And uh, Jim, it was really interesting. When we started this project, when we started writing the book, we wanted to represent kind of both ends of the spectrum. Jim is an outgoing, very extroverted, very successful entrepreneur who has been just a, a like an unbroken track record of success and consistency. You know, as eight years old, he won a, a paper boy selling new paper, selling newspaper subscriptions contest all the way up through uh, starting a business for five hundred dollars and growing it into a 17 million dollar a year business, selling it to Fortune 500, uh, retiring in uh, Arizona from moving from Maine. And by, by when Jim says he's in retirement, what that means is he's starting more businesses. <laughs> And he was on, uh, is it QVC or Home Shopping? Uh, I was on QVC 25 QVC, times. Yeah. QVC 25 times, sold millions of units of uh, product. And uh, I, I became aware of Jim, met Jim as a result of a network marketing company we were both involved in. Again, him very successful, me not so much. And uh, I, so so that's kind of the, and Jim mentions that that I'm introverted, and and I know that's you hear my story a little bit, stand up comic, and and then a professional speaker for more than 25 years, and it doesn't seem possible that you could be introverted. And trust me, I mean more performers are introverts than you can possibly imagine. And so we we are two different ends of the spectrum. We're both entrepreneurs, and we both had successes in in some different areas. I had success in speaking, but not success in uh, in network marketing. And that was kind of the genesis. That was my, when I began over four years ago, I was like, I want to find out why. How is it possible to be successful in one kind of venture and be an abject failure in another? And so that was like the genesis of the research. And then uh, we got a little bit further along and Jim joined me on this because I realized while I was talking to a great many people, who have, were consistency challenged. I also needed someone who had credibility that leaders could relate to those those people who who are consistent, who show up every day and doing the right things. They needed someone that they could relate to because what I was saying was was kind of out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and me as a you know as a entrepreneur and business builder and what some would call a, a leader. I think it's in our DNA to, to want to improve and want to get better. And it's always frustrating to me to, to uh, sponsor or, or even hire 10 sales reps or 10 distributors and, and only have two out of 10 become successful. And, and despite your efforts of introducing and implementing everything that you have done to make yourself successful. And so from, from a leader's point of view, um, I was really looking forward to really digging into the material even more. I mean, and, and from a personal point of view, I, I always wondered how I could be a 20% in, in so many areas and an 80% in other areas. And uh, so that's what kind of intrigued me to get together with George. Well, oh, go, go ahead, Martin. Well, no, I was just, 
so many questions as you're speaking pop up, but the one uh, that I think maybe we should handle first is if you guys could go in a little more deep, we're talking, we're talking about 80 and 20. Right. Can you define that a little bit further for the audience? Sure. I mean, and this, this has its genesis in Vilfredo Pareto, who was an 18th century Italian social scientist. And, and as we always like to say, everybody's name sounds better in Italian. And, uh, <laughs> It's true. So think about it. If if Vilfredo Pareto had been an American, Willie Parrot. I mean, who cares what he is? Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, you can feel free to call me Martino any day. Martino Meisenheimer. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, how much better? That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, this Italian came up, stumbled across what's been called the Pareto distribution or the Pareto principle, which basically says that eighty percent of all outcome comes from 20% of the input because what he he found that 80% of the wealth in Italy was owned by 20% of the people in virtually every sales organization you'll find that 80% of the salespeople do 20% 20% do 80% uh, and, it, and it's across every spectrum you can imagine and in real estate 80% of the homes will be sold by 20% of the brokers uh, in COVID this was I just read this and I just thought oh my god this is Unbelievable. 80% of COVID is spread by 20% of the people that are infected with it. Interesting. So, so this 80, 20 thing, but, but specifically applied to succeeding in careers where, you know, that the 20% the of the high achieving salespeople get 80% of the business generate 80% of the revenue. And, and I looked at that and I'm, I'm like, okay, I can understand how it would work in some things, but why people, I mean, people, we, you know, we're across the spectrum different and uh, what? So, what is the key deciding factor that, that determines whether you're one of these high-producing twenty percent folks or the eighty percent that life is more of a struggle for? And and so, when you eliminate all the things that are in common—intelligence, education, training, ability, even ambition—Jim, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Um, <laughs> all those things. Uh, are present in both groups. And so then what we boiled it down to that we found is really has the ring of truth and the, the, the solidarity of proof. And that is the difference is the 20% high achievers do what needs to be done when it needs to be done on a relentlessly consistent basis. Hmm. And the 80%, who, by the way, is who I identify with. And if you're listening to this thinking, well, I, it feels like I might be in that 80%. The 80% know what needs to be done, but they don't do it and they certainly don't do it consistently. And so we, we, we toss around these terms, 80 and 20% and 80 and 20 percenters. But again, if you feel like you, you probably identify with the 80%, which by the way, about four out of five people do, um, this is not about shame. This is about, not about being less than. I mean, we, we make a strong case, while well, we make a strong case, neurological science makes a strong case now, that the reason for that difference in ability to be consistent is not sh because you're short of will. This is probably the biggest misconception, is that people don't succeed because they don't have willpower. They just don't want it big enough, bad enough. They don't have a big enough dream. They aren't willing to do the work. No, those that's not, that's not what's going on. The, what's going on is there is a fundamental difference in how and where we think in our brains. And until you figure out, uh, until you understand that and you have a strategy to overcome the, the, that, that issue, it's always gonna be a challenge. It's the reason why all the things that, that people do, you know, whether it's the goal setting or the, the, you know, the intense planning and all these things, you know, in, in the, you have smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, those things, those tools work great for the people they work for. And for the people they don't work for, they're going to feel miserably with them. And that was me. That was my story. I did everything they told me to do, except consistently do the key things that were going to build a business. And that, that's one of the things that, that really struck me when I was reading the book is you were talking about how it wasn't from a lack of effort. It wasn't from a lack of will. It wasn't from a lack of self-awareness. You had all of that in abundance, but you just didn't have the strategy. Right. 
right. because of how you because of how the eighty percenters brain is wired. Right. So and, yeah, go ahead. So so this goes. I mean, the the study, the the kind of the genesis study of this goes back to the sixty seventies, where they did what was called the marshmallow test, and where they they took five year olds and set them down at a table and put a marshmallow in front of them and, and said, "I'm going to leave the room. You can eat the marshmallow if you want to, but if you if you don't." When you come back, we'll, we'll give you a second marshmallow. And Jim, we, I always ask Jim this way, as a five-year-old, what would little five-year-old Jim have done? Well, anytime I can get a 100% return on my investment, uh, uh, I would have waited. I would have got the second marshmallow. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. And, and, and I would have eaten the marshmallow before the guy done, got done explaining the experiment. He would, have been, he would have been, now you can, and I would be, oh. <laughs> so that's the, so, so Jim, has the ability to delay gratification and I am driven by instant gratification and delayed gratification is just it there. It's, it's the same thing as consistency. It's the same muscle. It's the same process. And so what they did is they followed these kids all through their lives. There was a huge difference in life experiences between the 20% who didn't eat the marshmallow and the 80% that did. And then it finally gets down into the two I think 2011, we now have the ability to look inside a human brain in real time, non-invasively. And they put these, the kids who are now in their fifties, they put them in a functional MRI machine and a, and a technician could look at the brain activity in, in one of two different areas of the brain and tell you with 100% certainty whether or not that subject did or did not eat the marshmallow 50 years prior. That's that amazing. is scary. Yeah. Think about it, that is really scary. And that's what we're up against. Because Jim, Jim, who's sitting there as a five-year-old kid saying, I want 100% return on my marshmallow, that's a prefrontal cortex decision. That's the ability to look at, the, at an action in the moment and project what the, what the likely outcome of that is, and then based on that outcome, decide whether or not they're going to do it. That's a, that's a much later developed part of the brain. And I'm, I'm back here in the ventral striatum, which is much more primal. Who ba The ventral striatum basically judges on three uh, criteria. Is it easy? And, and, and by the way, this is a part of the brain that goes back hundreds of millions of years. And it was fantastic because easy. OK, so easy was important when I was a caveman because all I'm doing is looking for food. And if I spend more time, more calories getting food than the food gives back to me, I'm going to die. So easy is really important. Safe, obviously important, because if I'm the guy that says, hey, look, look a, woolly, a woolly mammoth, I wonder if he'll let me pet him. OK, I'm not destined to have a lot of kids. I'm going to die. So safe is important. And then, and then uh, uh, pleasurable. We're trying to procreate the species. So easy, safe, pleasurable. The ESP filter is that's the part of my brain that gets activated that you can see on a functional MRI. And that's where I'm making decisions. So I can be looking at the exact same situation as Jim, trying to decide whether or not I'm going to do something. And if it's like an outgoing business call, Jim's going to look at that and go, I'm going to I'm going to pick up the phone because I know that it answers the question to me that if I pick up the phone, make a phone call, I'm going to be get closer to the goal, whatever that goal might be. So I'm going to take that action. So that's it. Right. Even, even though the act, the goal is perhaps well off. In oh, the horizon. oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. it's like when you're having a sales contest, Martin, and they announce a trip to Maui, uh, the, the front, the Typically, the first three rows of the audience are looking at it and going, I wonder if there's a way to, for me to win two trips. Mm -hmm. Whereas the tendency, the people in the back will say, well, that yeah, contest I'm, I'm is for, the, for Martin I'm, or Jim. I'm in the back thinking, I hope Jim sends me a postcard because I know I'm not the one. <laughs> yeah. so, so Jim makes a prefrontal cortex decision. I, I make a decision back here. We both want it really bad. We, and we, we can be looking at the same activity, whether or not to make like an outgoing sales call. And so especially, so I'm, I'm driven by this ESP filter, and you layer on that the fact that I am an introvert. So is it easy for me to pick up the phone? No, it is not. It is a challenge. Does it feel safe? No. They could say no. They could reject me. It could be a bad experience. It doesn't feel safe to me. Is it pleasurable? No. It is not pleasurable. So when I'm making my decision there, 
faced with exactly the same situation, exactly the same goals that we both want to go for, Jim is going to pick up the phone and I'm not. And what I'm going to do to soften the blow is I'm not going to say, you know what, I'm never going to pick up a phone because that means I'm never going to build a business. I'm never going to be successful. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because that's too painful. And I don't like to, I like to avoid pain. What instead I'm going to say is it's Monday. You can't call people on Monday. For the love of God, everybody's just back to work. I'll call on Tuesday and then Tuesday rolls around. But Tuesday, people are just recovering from Monday. Love of God, you can't call. And then Wednesday, they call it hump day for a reason, don't you think? Thursday, we're getting ready for the weekend. Friday, we're absolutely getting ready for the weekend. Then we can't call people on the weekend. That's nuts. So we're back to Monday. And so we just keep shoving off, pushing in further into the future, those things that would make us successful until finally the really the decision is going to be out of our hands. I mean, we've, we've, we've gotten so far away from the path that we can't find it again. I used to look at it, George, where, you know, goals were something I used to strive for, but the more I look back at it now, it, the thing that got me the closest to the goals was the, uh, the system that I was using. Right. Yeah. Right. And when you think about goals and goal setting, I mean, we're talking about basically one of the one of the big dividing things is, are you able to delay gratification or are you driven by instant gratification? And 80 percent of people are driven by instant gratification. So when you look at goal setting, what is a goal? A goal is nothing more than the embodiment of delayed gratification, which we've completely established. I suck at that. So is it any wonder that I can go through the same goal setting program that Jim does, the 10 year, the five year, the three, all the way down? And then Jim takes off like exactly. I, I, I was showing this to Martin earlier, my 10 step process. And yeah, yeah. And I've got a one step part process to throw that away. <laughs> yeah. I'm so that so when we when we say, well, gosh, I don't I guess maybe he didn't have written down goals. Maybe that's why he didn't succeed. Or possibly I wrote down my goals just like you told me to, but I suck at getting them. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look at that, it explains a lot of stuff. Well, you know, George, I used to look at people like you had what I thought had all the talent in the world. And, uh, and I would wonder why you wouldn't be successful. And so many times I would just chalk it up to uh, you weren't focused enough or not motivated enough or had the why that made you cry. Or, you know, and I hate that philosophy. Some will, some won't. So what next type of philosophy? And nothing could be you know, had been further from the truth yet for Years and years and years, I tried to cram down my daily eight scorecard, uh, not realizing there was seven too many things on there. Right. Well, and if you think about somebody like Jim as a leader, he's got a system. He's got a, a thing that he knows absolutely works. Yep. That's the trap of this. Yes. It's because you believe, well, I've proven this works. Yeah. So if it doesn't work for George, well, there's something wrong with George. And the real the reality is we have a mismatched strategy. We have a strategy that works great for Jim, but it does not work good for me. And so unless you understand that and then come up with a, a way to beat that, you know, it's, it's always going to be a struggle. You're always going to be watching people come in and out of businesses. And, yeah, and I wonder what happened to good old George, right? Yeah, really? yeah he had so much potential. I haven't <laughs> seen him the last few meetings or he hasn't been on the last few calls. I wonder what happened to him. Yeah, and so for the leader, the leader gets frustrated oh. because they can't figure out, you know, I have this remarkable system. I've honed it over decades. Yeah. It's perfect. It works great. Yeah. And yet 80% of the people aren't following through on it. Yeah. So they get frustrated. But then I'm curious to hear a little bit more about from the 80 percenters perspective, which is me. Um, so, so many times, you know, sitting in the back of the room and, and you, let's just take the contest announcement example, uh, one of two things could happen when that, when that contest gets announced, um, either I'm going to say, ah, you know what, Jim Packard, front row, why bother? Yeah. You know, he's going to win it, so I'm not even going to bother trying. Or I might have a momentary um, motivation that yep. kicks in and I get excited, especially because you've got a, a powerful presenter at the front of the room that's raising the energy level in the building. And I got caught up and swept up in that momentary emotion 
And so I'm like, sign me up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> One more ride on the roller coaster, please. Yeah. please. And the thing that's crazy about it is I've been through this over and over and over again. And it's a, it's a cycle that repeats itself ad nauseum. And yet yeah. I still can get caught up in that same, yep. uh, on that same ride. And at the end of the ride, it's so it always ends the same, right? So I'm wondering, from George, from your perspective, what was that like to go through that process over and over again? Having the self awareness that you, that you do, um, it was brutal. Yeah, I mean, it was, right. it's the reason why we wrote this book. It's a re I wanted to get to the bottom of this. Because I would I would sit there, you know, it's, it's a sun, a sun Saturday meeting or whatever, and they announce the thing, and I'm as fired up as everybody else, and just, this is the time, man. This is the one. This is the one I was waiting for. This one's different. Oh, I want this. The problem is that that we talk about this. Motivation is a, is a feeling, and feelings are transitory. I mean, they come and go with the wind. And so you can be feeling great and then you get a call and it's bad news or something else. And suddenly, all of a sudden, you know, when it, when it gets down to taking that action that's going to get you the trip or get you whatever it is that you were so excited about two days ago. First of all, you don't have the people there with you. You don't have the, 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 the emotional support system that you had in that moment. And it's down to you. And you're thinking, I want to do this. I'm absolutely going to do this. I mean, there's no question I'm going to do it. I just, just not. To, this morning is bad. I mean, I got, the, got this you know, Zoom call thing coming up. And, and, it, and, and eventually, even somebody as resilient as I was and wanted network marketing as much as I did, at some point in time, you just go, you know what? This ain't your dream. I mean, this is not, this is not uh, a, a sustainable life for you. It's yeah. good for somebody else. And I know, you know, I wish Jim well and God love him. And I know he's going to be good at this, but you know what, this is just a good life choice for me right now. Right. And that's, I mean, that's what I did. And it's funny. I will, I will just as, to, as an aside, people say to me, well, how could you suck so bad at this one kind of business, but you get into something that's, that's fairly brutally competitive, which was stand up comedy and professional in the world of professional speaking. How could you do that? And I'm like, well, it's easy. Literally, because it's the ESP filter. Writing and performing stand up comedy for me, humor for me, super easy. I fall out of bed. I can do it. It's just it's just as natural as it could be easy, safe. I've been on stages for 35 years professionally. Nothing feels safer to me than being on a stage and pleasurable. People applaud when you come to work. They applaud when you go home. I mean, it. There, the reason why I could do that business Easy, safe, pleasurable. There was no, there was no roadblock to me there. No. Right. Yeah, that always get me. I remember the, uh, you know, we'll be on an airplane, and and George would get in an airplane, and put his earphones on, and not talk to anybody around him. And I look around and go, my oh God, everybody's my prospect, especially up in this first class section. Uh, I'll know. I'll say hello to everybody. Somebody's going to talk to me, and. Uh, <laughs> You didn't. You, know, you never realized that, you know that, you know you would think that George would be so outgoing, and yet he's not. And the same thing goes true, George. You know, I've been successful in in, in marriage. In fact, we just celebrated our fiftieth year in marriage, and have two kids who have their heads on straight and had good business. And spiritually, I'm all set. But I've always struggled with uh, with uh, you know with physical goals. Right. And, I always used to ch chalk it up to, well, the other things are more important to me. Well, they really weren't. I was just making excuses. And uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting split because you can be a twenty percent high achiever in a lot of areas of your life, and still, I mean, we talk about Oprah. I mean, Oprah is a businesswoman. Oh my God, you can't touch her. But she struggled consistently with weight and health and. And, uh, and she and she has all the advantages of the world. I mean, she's got the money. She's got she could have private chefs and personal. Oh, I'll, here I'll let the heckling begin. Uh, she has private chefs and personal trainer. I mean, she could pay somebody a thousand bucks a day just to follow her around and slap food out of her face. Yeah. So, <laughs> and yet she's still you know and still that challenge is there because literally the place the she's making business decisions here. 
and she's making health decisions back there. And there are two, and it's like you have to have two different strategies to deal with those two different challenges. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about the the strategy for the eighty percent? Because we do yeah. have an answer. I'd hate to leave people out there hanging. Like, oh yeah, my God. I was going to suggest let, let's um, let's get into some solution talk now because I think we uh, otherwise <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we yeah, have a, a lot of frustrated people out there. So yeah. good night, everybody. Enjoy your life. <laughs> what um, happens next? Oh, so sorry to hear, but um, <laughs> some will, so you were one of them. That yeah, didn't. I, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I kind of found out that there were three data points that, that kind of the, the Pareto thing, the 80, 20 thing kind of set up what the, the, the extent of the challenge and then the, the marshmallow test and all the other brain studies that I've looked at since and outlined where the challenge was, what it was. It was a structural inside our brain challenge because we were wired differently. And so then the third piece of the puzzle came from the most unlikely source possible. That was Jerry Seinfeld. And I read an article with Jerry, an interview with Jerry online, and he was talking about uh, having a kid come up to him and young, young comic and said, how can I be Jerry Seinfeld? And he said, well, okay, first of all, that's not the goal. That was never my goal. Um, you know, it wasn't about limos and Learjets. It was, he said, my goal was very, very simple. And by the way, by the way, I talk about this a great deal in the book, but his, the way he set up his goal violates everything you hear about in goal setting, which is a positive because the other traditional goal setting stuff has not worked for us. You mean so, like smart goals? Yeah, yeah. And I, I've mentioned those before when you apparently had to, Catch a flight. I don't know where you went. Oh, well, you you were talking about stuff that I couldn't relate to. <laughs> what are you doing here at all, then? Because none of this. Uh, Apparently, so the twenty percenters are easily bored with us eighty percent. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. He was off making a sales call. I hope. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so Jerry said his goal was not the limos and lair jets. His goal was to become a better comic. And that violates all the goal setting because it's not specific, it's not measurable, it doesn't have a date, it doesn't have a dollar figure attached to it, but we call them ER goals. Better is an ER goal. And he said what he did was he selected an activity that he knew would take him in the direction of being a better comic, a high leverage activity, something that's really going to matter. If he did it on a continuous basis, it was going to make a big difference. And that was write jokes. And so he wrote jokes the first day, got a calendar, put an X on the calendar. Wrote jokes the second day, put an X on the calendar. The genius of Jerry Seinfeld is a day three. He did not look at that calendar and see two X's on a calendar. What he saw were, were two links on a chain. And so now he got a very, very specific task, a very specific goal, something that the ESP filter can get its head around. And that is this. Third day, our only goal, third day, don't break the chain. Don't break the chain. And I read that and I wondered about I, I wondered about my whole life. I went on as a comic and I saw Jerry perform and I thought, man, there's a there's a huge difference in skill level at where I am right now, where he is. And I'm like, I have no idea how to bridge that gap. Well, don't break the chain is how you bridge that gap. I, and everything that has come from that fruition of nothing more than the compound interest on consistent action day after day after day. And you can see what it's resulted in for Jerry. I mean, he's, he's, he's earned it. He, ha he has to have earned a billion dollars because he got 800 million for uh, selling the sitcom. So uh, I saw that and I thought, wow, that's interesting. And because I am who I am, the way I think, I took it took me a month to decide to try it. And so I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna pick an area of my life I've never been particularly consistent about and that's working out. So I went to work out the first day and I made it I was gonna be my my ER goal was I was gonna be fitter, healthier, stronger. And I went to work out and I came back, put an X on the calendar. Went to work out, put an X on the calendar, and I built a chain of five hundred and thirty one straight workout days without missing a day. And the reason why this works is because I'm driven by instant gratification. And this is an instant gratification strategy. By defining my goal that way, fitter, stronger, healthier, 
when I would come back from the gym, I could look myself in the mirror and smile because why? Because I hit my goal. I was fitter. I was stronger. I was healthier. And so I wasn't waiting for some far, far off goal in the distance, which I'm not good at doing. What I'm, what I'm good at is winning today. And it feels good. And I get a little dopamine serotonin surge in my brain, which means I'm probably going to come back tomorrow. And uh, by breaking it down that way, I, I, I had my ER direction, the direction I'm going in, but that's not my focus. My focus is just don't break the chain. And because of that, it was very simple. It was very easy to uh, to to deal with. And eventually, over time, what you do is you re you rewire your brain. I mean, it's it's neuroplasticity. And what used to be a decision is now just a habit or an action. It's um, no longer am I going to work out today. It's it's what workout am I going to do? And right? and you felt good about yourself every oh single God, day yeah. because you're yeah. accomplishing your goal every day. And that's where you were getting your your daily gratification and. If you apply the same thing in a sales contest, rather I'm a better prospect or I'm a better recruiter, whatever it might be, I'm a better leader. If you if you do some activity that gets you close to that every single day, chances are that you won't quit and you might just win that trip to Maui. Right. Or if you're in the business, regardless of what kind of business it is, and you isolate the key factors that are going to be things that are going to make you successful. And you start building. We, we suggest people just build one chain at a time. So you want to find the really the, the, the most high leverage activity you can do. And if it's uh, for a, for an entre for a uh, introverted entrepreneur, and I will tell you this because while I, I'm on stage and I feel very, very comfortable, I was also put in some situations that required, required more extroversion. So I'd be speaking at a banquet and I'm sitting there at a table with the CEO of a company and all the leadership around there. And I'm expected to be kind of like the guy that they hired, which is supposed to be this funny, amusing guy. And you can't sit there and just eat your soup. They'll look at you funny. And so, <laughs> so well, I, I like, think. George, you went on a cruise to, to give a speech to, to uh, it was the first one that we had done. And he was on a cruise ship uh, because it was an incentive cruise and he was speaking. And, and he sat at a table by himself. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> because I could. They let me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but that's also that was a three day cruise. Yeah. So I can't keep that up for three days. Yeah. So I, I have the ability. I developed an ability that I call it's, it's situational extroversion. Mm -hmm. If a situation absolutely positively requires me to be the first one to reach out, to engage and do all that, I can do it. Yeah. I can't do it for long. I certainly can't do it for three days, but I can do it for a while. And then I'm going to go to bed for a week because it, <laughs> it takes a ton out of me. But the other thing, I mean, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur that's fighting introversion, just know there are those moments where you're gonna be, it's going to be required. You just make that deal with yourself. Okay, just for 20 minutes, just for whatever this period of time is, I'm going to kind of access a part of me that doesn't feel particularly comfortable. And I'm going to step into this new role of being the guy that's going to stick my hand out and introduce myself to people and work the room. And, uh, and then I, then I can go back to being me after it's over. And what happens over time is you get better at it and it gets easier and it's less of a, because you realize, you know, it's easy, safe, pleasurable. you you realize, well, this is getting easier. Nothing's ever bad happened to me. It's safe. And wh whether or not I'm ex experiencing pleasure in the moment or not, I'm certainly experiencing pleasure when it's done because now I did something that was challenging for me. And, uh, you know, and it feels good to have to have pushed my limits and, and gone somewhere that's not easy for me. Yeah. So there's yeah. pleasure in that part. You know, the same thing holds true, George and, and Martin, with a 20 percenter. I remember when we started talking about doing our, our program, which we call a 21 program. And. And, and part of it is reaching out to two people a day. And when we started talking about it, George, uh, it's been 874 days uh, since I, I started that. And uh, I've only missed one day. And to a 20 percenter, it becomes fun. It's easy, obviously it's easy, safe and pleasurable and it's fun. So this, our program is good for a 20 percenter. It'll make the 20 percent even stronger. And obviously uh, the 80 percenters that will uh, will give them a, a way to receive that daily gratification too. Yeah. 
so, so guys, um, let's go back to the chain link concept for a minute. Uh, first of all, let me just say one of, I think one of the reasons I really love this book is because you used the Seinfeld example. He's to this day, he's still my all time favorite comic. It probably not one day goes by that I don't quote some Seinfeldian <laughs> situation. I can't get through a day. Oh, right. Um, so there's that. But then I want to I want to talk a little bit more about the actual act of of putting that X on the calendar, both in terms of the physical, in terms of neuroscience. What have you learned in your research about making that physical act of putting the X on the calendar? Um, in terms of it being physical, but also visual, being able to right. see it. Yeah, it's just another way to interface. The fact is that behind me, you can see my first year of my my fitness chain. It was just literally going up there and I would make a little mark on the calendar and I, and I would put down what I what I, um, what I I did that day as, as an activity. And there is, the more you engage in that, the more you, uh, Cause it's kind of a congratulations thing too. It's like, I did it. You know, there's a, there's an action to it. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, we, we kind of took it to another level. And that is we, we developed an app uh, called the chain gang app. And what we, what we did, it started out as a case study where we got people, we just wanted to be able to track the metrics. We wanted, we did, we did pre-survey uh, questionnaires to find people that struggled with, with consistency. Jim went through selected all the people that were all stars. I went well, through I, I went, No, I went through the 20 or the, the 100 of them and picked out the top 20. I picked out 20 people that I thought that could really rock this and, and really give us the metrics that we were looking for. And I was so proud. I went through them and I discarded uh, eight, the other 80. And of course, George had the same copies that I did. And I said, well, just for the heck of it, go through them, George. And you, you come up with 20 and let's see how many overlap. So let me ask you, Martin, how many do you think overlap between my 20 and George's 20? <laughs> yeah, your silence is correct. None. Yeah. Absolutely none. And George picked the ones that people that might have made one call a week or one call a month or whatever it was. And I'm going, why would you pick these people, George? This, we want these metrics to, you know, to be... Uh, really uh, influential when we talk to different business owners. But we took the we took George's 20 that he picked and literally overnight, we took people that had a five to 15% activity level and they were having results over, over 80%, George, 83%, somewhere in that area. And uh, George is frozen on us right now. He's frozen, so, George. Yeah, George is frozen just all right. Well, he hates making cold calls anyway, so that's just pretty appropriate. But, but, but that's, that's amazing. That's, that's really remarkable. And so was that was that the big aha moment that for you? Because, okay, at that point, was that the first where you'd actually, you know, really experimented with what you were finding in the research on a larger scale besides just the two of you? Yeah, really what it did is validate everything that we had been working working with. And what was amazing was that, We've been doing some, we call them chain gangs, and we've been doing these chain gangs now for uh, one particular group over about a year and a half now. And and they literally overnight went up over 80% activity ratio, and that's through the, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and, and obviously the, the, you know, the, the virus. So it's been extremely uh, gratifying to us to see that we do have a method that actually works. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think that you, you would be correct in saying that Martin. So mm -hmm. I think George left because I did earlier. You know, <laughs> just call, just call yeah. Take that. yeah. He's trying to be as cool as you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so, right. Yeah. An another thing that I'd like you to discuss a little bit with us, Jim is, uh, in the book you get into, okay, now we understand the concept and we know how to implement it and you, you get started. And you have you suggest that we choose just one area and just create one one ER goal with a with a chain that you're going to work on at a time. Talk a little bit more about why it becomes just so much more difficult to do more than one, and and how long does it take before you say, okay, I think I got it. 
Well, you know, as a as a twenty percenter, I probably took four or five different chains and, and did them, and um, uh, and that was too many. I, I you know, obviously for uh, uh, for an eighty percenter is way too many. In fact, I think George even talks about it in the book where he did one particular chain, and then after a few months, he started another one and realized that he hadn't reached momentum in the first one yet. So, uh, so it's it's important to do one chain, but Pick a pick an area, whatever it might be, uh, that's really important to you, so that when you get done and you have uh, and and you've completed it, you know you, you've done the chain long enough, so it's you don't even have to think about it. That it's going to give you the results that you're looking for. And uh, so yeah, pick pick one chain and and work on that one chain until you don't even think about it any longer. In fact, I did the calendar thing where I checked it off on the calendar for months and months and months and months and months. And after a while, you you forget to uh, even, you know, check it off on the calendar because it's just so ingrained with you. So. And so that's the point that, that in your, that's where how you define momentum. That's what momentum looks like. Yes, yeah. So you don't even have to think about it. You're doing, it's not whether or not you're gonna do the workout is what kind of workout you're gonna do. And, and keep in mind, the chain will break at some point. I mean, it's gonna happen. I mean, I, I was doing a chain and, and then all of a sudden I twisted my ankle so I couldn't walk anymore. I mean, I literally couldn't walk. So it will happen that the chain will break. You've got to have a plan B. Maybe that day you, you read something on exercising a diet or whatever whatever you have. But uh, it will happen. But uh, just don't, you know, the nice thing about breaking the chain is that when you start it over again, you're starting with, a, you know, the new chain mentality. So it's a very strong aspect of it. So. So it's important when when the chain breaks, it breaks, it's inevitable, and don't beat yourself up over it. Yeah, it's, no. it's, it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's not, you know, initially pick an activity that that um, you know, you, you know, that's not too difficult. Pick one because remember, uh, you're, what you're trying to do is show up every day. I mean, it's so the activity doesn't matter as much as it does the fact of showing up and and doing the activity, whatever that might be. That makes sense. And do you ever suggest that? So let's take the example of um, a, an ER goal of reaching out every day, right? Sure. So you can do some some number of reach outs. Do you ever do you advocate for getting the chain established and then at some point bumping up the number? Uh, in this case, oh, yeah. number of reach outs. Yeah. When how, first... how do you know when it when it's the appropriate time to um, to change your number? Well, to give you a great example of that, I remember when we were coming up with the 21 concept and and with George, with, I, mean, I mean, I didn't do him justice in the introduction, but he's a big deal in the speaker's world. And and when we started the consistency chain, I said, well, George, just reach out to one of your buddies, one person. I mean, you've been doing this for 30 years, one company, one buddy, one advertising agent, just talk to one person and uh, and let's start that chain. And I remember him looking at me and going, mm. I mean, it was like the deer in the headlight looked. And, uh, and, and, and he said, I don't like if I can do it one a day. And as a 20 percenter, I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me, one a day. I mean, that's, I said, well, you can at least reach out to somebody, can't you? And he says, well, yeah, if I didn't have to talk to him. And, and there's the difference between the 80 and the 20. And, and I said, okay, well, let's just reach out to two people. And, uh, just reach out to them on Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever you have and just say, hey, I'm sure a lot of, I know a lot of crazy things are happening in my life as I'm sure there are yours. Hey, let's schedule a, t a time to talk sometime. And, and that's a reach out. And what happens if you're reaching out and well, only reaching out to two people a day, and that can be on LinkedIn, Facebook, email, whatever. At some point, people are going to start calling you back. When they call you back, you're going to, you're going to be forced to have the conversation and and it will happen at that at that point. So, and I'd be remiss if I said, George, where have you been? It's, he's frozen again. He's frozen again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what about um, Jim? You know, all of what you just said flies in the face of of what anyone who's been in sales, either in conventional business or network marketing, especially network marketing, right? Yeah. We're, we're constantly drilled from our our manager or our upline to take massive action, right? But it sounds like what you're saying is 
for the 80 percenter, that's that's exactly the opposite approach. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I remember the first network marketing company I got involved with, and they overnighted me the book because I was leaving the next day to travel back to Maine, and we we driven from Arizona to Maine 25 times. And on one of those trips, uh, just before we started it, I joined a network marketing company, and and the first thing you said was, well, reach out to uh, make a list of 100 people. I mean, I put the book down. I mean, I'm a 20 percenter. I didn't even want to make a list of of 100 people, yet alone call them. So, um, you know, it works for some people, and I understand the philosophy about it, and I think it's good for some people. Uh, but it certainly would scare the heck out of somebody like George. That's for sure. I probably could have got through it, but it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been comfortable. So, well, I, you know, one of the things that reinforces that is the people who you see up on stage. The stories that they're telling are invariably about their massive action strategy and hey look it worked for me right so it's constantly being reinforced in yeah. who, who the management or the upline elevates and how they rarely do does the upline showcase this person who's achieved something um off the charts and emphasize the the activity involved the, the commitment to um, to the action, right? It's usually about the outcome, the result, more than it is about the, the action to get there. Yeah, and the same thing. It drives me nuts sometimes in some of these companies that we work with. They highlight all the new recruits rather than the new customers. And uh, and uh, I think if you do, I know it for a fact because I've, you know, I, I, I proved it myself by or reaching out and talking to one person a day and showing whatever product or service I'm marketing, I was successful. And uh, I obviously uh, uh, preached that to, you know, my, both my kids. Both my kids were runner-up and distributors of the year as well. And they were following that same philosophy. But then again, they had to because they were in the will. So, you know, they had to follow that philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to get back to one thing when you said you can increase the intensity later on. I mean, when I sit here, I do the goal of 21, which is reaching out to two people a day or talking to one. I've done that for over 800 days now. and But at the same time, there's days when I reach out to 10 people or, or talk to three or four or five people. Uh, now, I get the ch check off the, off the calendar when I've done the 21, and I feel good about myself. So, uh, so. that's Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question, so I'm glad you, you said that. The other thing I'm curious to hear about is, and, and you may may or may not know this from your research, but I'm, I, you've worked with enough people now with this approach that I'm sure you have a sense for, is there correlation between 80, the 80 percenters and introversion versus extroversion? Are they in any way related or not? Doesn't not so much? Well, I'll give you a great example. I mean, I'm a 20 percenter in growing a business. I'm a 20 percent, you know, I'm a 20 percenter, uh, you know, spiritually, I, I believe. Uh, but I'm an 80 percenter in other areas. And so those of the, I mean, I have two chains going on right now. One is prospecting, at which I'm over 865. I have 800, 865 out of 867 days. The one day I didn't work was Memorial Day this year. I just, for some reason, that I just put everything down. But the other one is uh, is a fiscal goal. And that's the toughest one for me to do because I can find all kinds of excuses. So, uh, you know, I'm not running a marathon. I'm just wa wa walking around the block now, down the hill, up the hill and over. And I do it every day. And I feel better about that than I do my, my prospecting goal. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. but, but how about in terms of, 80 percenters and 20 percenters versus introverts and extroverts. Is there is there any correlation? Are are 80 percenters more likely to be introverts or is it not related? From well, I, you know, I'm not sure. George, you probably could answer that better. I mean, I'm amazed that, you know, that he is a, he's not as outgoing off the stage as he is on the stage. I mean, we'll do a, a program and we get done with the program, I mean, the majority of the audience can relate to him, obviously, 80%, right? And they go up to him and give him hugs and kisses and go, oh, my gosh, finally somebody's speaking our language. And the 20 percenters will come up to me and go, really, that's how they think? And, 
you know, so it's, that's been really eye opening. And I mean, I'd be really comfortable with the hugs and kisses, but I don't get them from you. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's great. Well, we do, we, I, one thing I did want to point out and George mentioned it, that we, um, we've been doing the calendar forever and we came, we finally came out with an app and it's called the chain gang app.com. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't go to the app store. It's a web-based app. So you'd go to your browser, Chrome or Safari, whatever it was. And you can, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, $7 and 97 cents. I think the way George says is one cup of coffee will uh, change your day and two cups of coffee will change your life. And, and we have what we call the chain gang app.com. And uh, we put people in groups of five, and it's very interactive in those groups. You can talk back and forth to the people through uh, posting things and keeps track of your racial, your percentage of, for you as well as yours against the team. And, and we found that, I think it was Emerson that said that we make us, we need someone to make us do the things we're capable of doing. And this app has really helped us. It's kept us account accountable, Martin. That's great. Uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. Is that what you suggest as as a next step? Um, it, it should people go and pick. I, I highly recommend everyone to um, you know pick up the book. <laughs> but um, should they should they read the book and then uh, and then check? You know, out the we'd love to think that everybody would go get the app and just dig into it. But uh, from a personal standpoint, I think that if they read the book they would buy into the philosophy and then the app would make much more sense afterwards. Yeah, so I'm just gonna throw up a, a quick shot. This is this is the cover of the book, The Consistency Chain for Network Marketing. It's a remarkably simple process for harnessing the power of habit, eliminating self-sabotage and achieving your goals. Yeah, so, and I might add, we wrote a book just prior to that. Uh, we wrote this one called The, the, the Chain Gang and then we wrote another one called the uh, consistency is a new currency and uh, uh, but you can be in any business I mean we just had a, a real estate agent bought a few hundred of our our book for network marketing only because the same philosophy applies so right yeah yeah absolutely so last question and then I'll let you go you've been very generous with your time here today Jim do you think that uh, given all the research that that you and George have done and the, the several books now that you've written on the subject, is it easier nowadays for whether you're an 80 percenter or a 20 percenter to A, either be a leader or B, um, be someone who achieves as an 80 percenter? Is it, is it easier today than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago? I, I, I think so. And, and, and keep in mind one thing, when we, when we talk about in sales, the 80-20 rule, in network marketing is probably closer to 95.5, right? And, uh, but we're not naive enough to think that we can that we can help everybody that's part of that 80% group. But we can certainly take a fractal of it, and to, and we can we can help perhaps the 20% of the 80% yeah. and move them up a level. And that's the difference we see because uh, everybody wants to improve; they want to get better. Uh, it's just that the strategy has been wrong. And, and, and uh, I think that's why we're getting a lot of press from a lot of large companies right now is that we have a strategy that can tap into the 80% and which they've never, never had before. So uh, yeah, I think it's easier now. Yeah. Well, any, uh, before we let you go here, uh, any parting thoughts for our audience today, Jim? Uh, I, I, I like one particular saying, it says, persistence will get you there, but consistency will keep you there. Awesome. That's great. That's And it was fun doing this without George. Yeah, probably. Now you, <laughs> you can just go. You, you don't have yeah, to share. Yeah. So I'll uh, say thank you for having us on, Martin. It's been a it's, pleasure uh, uh, being your guest. It's been my pleasure completely. Uh, so I just want to officially thank George Campbell, Jim Packard for a great interview. I'm sure that all the introverted entrepreneurs in our audience have a much clearer understanding now of the realities of taking consistent action now that we've cleared up a lot of the myths and misconceptions. So thank you very much, Jim, for sharing your expertise and your experience so graciously. And I will say one thing, Martin, yeah, I just so you know, George just moved into a, a new location over the weekend. And uh, I'm sure he has some computer challenges that 
we didn't expect. So, uh, so I apologize for that, but uh, maybe you'll have us back again. I would love to have you back again uh, anytime. You, the, the invitation is always open to both of you. This was tremendous. And I'm absolutely certain that the audience got uh, a tremendous amount of value out of this. It was really wonderful. Awesome. So uh, once again, I want to invite you to check out their book or books about the consistency chain mm -hmm. and um, how to take action on a consistent basis, the power of habit and eliminating the self-sabotage around achieving your goals. Jim and George, thank you once again, and have, have a great, great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.